Hello BookTube. I, it's been five minutes since my last video. I've moved into the other room. I'm testing the air conditioning. It seems like the sound is not going to interfere, which is good because it's pretty muggy here. So I'm hunched over in perfect line with uh, the cool air coming out. And I changed my soaked t-shirt into another soaked t-shirt. And I want to talk about uh, the spicy pulps. Um, I, a few days ago, or, or a couple weeks ago now, I guess he put it up, um, Gavin at Genre Stories put up a great video about the spicy pulps, which I'll link to in the comments and refer uh, to, for people who don't know and who are interested, it's, he does a pretty good overview of them, uh, of what that subgenre was. I think I've talked about them a little bit before too. I know I had some Western stories, some spicy Western stories written by Norval Page that I didn't like at all, um, but, I, but I enjoyed Gavin's video, so I looked on my Kindle to see if I had anything. I thought I might, and I did. I had this. I have this one, the Spicy Mystery Mega Pack, one of the Mega Pack series. It was ninety nine cents, sometimes forty nine cents, sometimes nineteen cents. I think I've seen one as low as eight cents before. Uh, from Wild from John Benton Court at Wildside Press. Uh, it's got twenty five stories in it, all spicy mysteries. You know, of course, there are many other subgenres. Uh, Mystery and crime probably being the most famous. Uh, so I don't think I'm going to read the whole thing. At least not for... Well, who knows? Because I read the first story anyway. But here's some of the stuff. Now I'm looking at... Here's the... Uh, I don't know if you can really see this or if it's interesting to you, but here's the list. You can see some of the titles. Batman by Victor Rousseau. I'm sure that was picked for this anthology just because of his title. Um, Pallid Mistress. You can see here one called Women Are Damned Fools by Hubie Cave, which is really the only name I recognize in here. I think there's one other name I recognize. Not that I'm a big expert on uh, pulp writers, but most a lot of these are under pen names or or they don't know. In fact, this Hubie, Ga Hubie Cave story was originally written under the title, under the pseudonym Just In Case. Well, isn't that clever? Just In Case. Anyway, so I read the first story. Here's the, there's a, a, a quick note from the publisher here. <clears throat> Here is a selection of 25 tales from the spicy line of mystery pulps, full of politically incorrect, even for their own time, tales of murder, weird menace, sex, sadism, bondage, and other stuff parents wouldn't want their kids reading. But, but by modern standards, they are quite tame, but can be fun if you're in the mood for a trip down the dark alleys of pulp publishing. Enjoy. So I was in the mood for one of those. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, too hot to sleep again. I picked this up and I read the the first one, which is uh, from Spicy Detective Story, September 34, and Death by Telephone. The title struck me, and I had to look this up later because I know there's a movie, there's a Bella, Bella Lugosi movie from the same era called Death by or Murder by Television. Or is it Death by Television? Now I can't remember. This is a 55-minute, you know, a B movie about an inventor of television uh, getting killed by it, and there's a mystery. And and you know, I looked at, I checked that out to see that it, that came out in 35. So I wondered if one was stolen from the other. No way to tell, really. But it, you you could see a scenario where the screenwriter is trolling through pulps, recent pulps sees the title Death by Telephone and decides, well, hey, heck, I'll just ratchet it up and do a Death by Television. Who knows? Anyway, so I read it, and it's uh, really, really purple prose, which I think a lot of these probably have. It's interesting because this prose, and I'll read a couple of little short paragraphs here, is probably what people thought pulps were. It's just imagine you're reading, you know, 
you've got this at the same time that Robert Howard and Catherine Moore and H.P. Lovecraft are writing in weird tales and you know really pushing the the boundaries of the genre, of the fantasy genres and you've got in Black Mask you've got Raymond Chandler and and uh, other writers who today appear in whose books are now universally acknowledged as, as American classics really changed the 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 form of American prose you know and have Library of America editions and whatnot and in the same and in the same rack or the you know maybe a, maybe one or two shelves above or over the counter at the, at the same newsstand you have spicy detective stories and I think at the time and maybe even today among literary snobs and stuff this level of writing in death by telephone uh, is what people thought of as being pulp writing and I don't know why it just strikes me as, as very interesting that there's such a broad range here's here's the the, I don't know why I showed you that, the black and white version. Anyway, uh, you know, you've, in Spicy Detective Stories, September 1935, you've got a story that starts out, Red headlights bored macabre holes through the rain-drenched night as the official coupe of District Attorney Halloran roared forward. In the twin crimson glares, the slanting raindrops seemed like sinister globules of blood. So that's two sentences in a row that describe the red headlights. The red headlights and then the twin crimson glares, which are the same red headlights, I assume. And the third sentence, the car's siren shrieked its tortured wail above the storm. District Attorney Halloran, in case we forgot he was District Attorney from the uh, sentence above, crouched over the wheel, his lean face a tense mask. Or his tense face a lean mask, maybe. By his side sat Detective Sergeant Ben Wade, grim-lipped and taut. The detective spoke a question over the roar of the motor. When did Judge Jeffries get this threatening phone call? So they immediately start talking about stuff they've already talked about so that the, so that the reader can be caught up on the story. District Attorney Halloran answered in clipped sentences. Fifteen minutes ago, he notified me at once. Judge Jeffrey is the one who sentenced Joe Durkin to hang. Yesterday, Durkin escaped from the train that was taking him to Folsom's condemned row, got away clean, and now Durkin has phoned Judge Jeffries to tell him that he intends to kill him at 10 o'clock tonight, and it's past nine now. So a lot of information there uh, for our benefit. Halloran stepped down savagely on the gas, so I don't know if he was... Uh, I don't know if he just floored it at that time because he realized it's 9 o'clock. Then Wade says, what, uh, what's been done? I've had the Jeffries home surrounded by plainclothes men, the district attorney answered. You're to be on the inside. You'll stick with the judge every minute. Don't let him get out of your sight. Wade nodded. His heavy jaw moved forward pugnaciously. One might even say his pugnacious jaw moved forward heavily. You know, this guy, this is... Uh, very generous on the adjectives and the ad, uh, adverbs. Uh, let's see what else we got here. But nothing spicy yet. We gotta wait till we get into Judge Jeffrey's home. When Halloran and Wade leap out of their car. Oh, here's a good sentence. Uh, here we are. Uh, and slewed the heavy coupe into the driveway of, of an old-fashioned two-story residence. The car's weighted rear end cracked down against the springs as the back wheels took the bump. The machine came, the machine being the car, came to a skidding stop on the wet gravel in front of the garage behind the house. Okay, good. So now we know exactly where we are behind the house. That's important, I guess. Halloran and Wade leaped out at the front door of Judge Jeffrey's home. The district attorney punched the bell. Can't Press the bell. You punch the bell. This is a spicy pulp. This is a hardcore story. You punch a doorbell. Uh, a woman, white-faced and fearful, admitted them. Halloran said, Mrs. Jeffries, this is Detective Sergeant Wade. He'll be your husband's bodyguard tonight. Okay, now we're getting spicy. Wade studied the woman. 
She was not over 30, naturally. Her hair was the color of dull gold. Remember that. Her hair was the color of dull gold. This is probably the most important detail in the story, given the fact that every description of her for the rest of the story, her hair color is mentioned. And her mouth, and her red mouth was warm and potentially passionate. Her hair was the color of dull gold, and her red mouth was warm and potentially passionate. All right. Uh, he can he can perceive across space that her mouth is warm. Her tight-fitting dress revealed the swelling curves of her svelte hips and full erect breasts. She moved with an easy, lithe grace, like a tamed tigress. She favored the detective with a slow, searching smile. You look capable and and dependable, Sergeant. Her voice was a risk, husky contralto. She gave the detective her slim hand. To Ben Wade, there was something electrifying in the touch of her cool fingers on his broad palm, in his broad palm. Wade suddenly understood why Judge Jeffries, sixty and a widower, had come to marry this voluptuous creature less than a year before. She aroused primitive desires in a man. They, meaning uh, the district attorney and, and Wade the cop, uh, follow her inside the house into a small study lined with bookshelves. Judge Jeffries, an elderly man with leonine white hair, you know, we were reminded that he's elderly because it was only two sentences ago that we were told he was 60 years old, uh, so we've got to make sure we know that he's elderly and he has white hair. There's like really a lot of boosting of the word count here with these details repeated over and over. He smiled at the district attorney. You didn't waste much time getting here, Hal, he said quizzically. I'm not sure what's quizzical about that statement. Anyway, uh, go along. Here's some other funny sense. I don't know. This stuff just tickles me because it's, you know, and it's not bad. It's very purple, but it's very vivid. It's very, you know, what kind of, you know, this is pure trash in the, in the best sense. Um, there's, uh, goes on and on. They look around the house, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the judge is, uh, oh, here we go. This is good. Wade sat down. That's the cop. In that intense crackling atmosphere, the four remained in strained, silent, strained silence. Judge Jeffries, dignified and aloof. The golden-haired Gilda Jeffries, we finally find out her name, uh, nervously twisting a handkerchief, district at Attorney Halloran, his lean face flushed with excitement, and Ben Wade, broad-shouldered, quiet, capable. Uh, so we're still, you know, halfway through the story, we're still getting physical descriptions of, of, of these folks. You know, and we're reminded that Gilda Jeffries has golden hair. Somewhere in the depths of the big old house, a clock chimes ten times, like measured strokes of doom. Okay, ten, ten o'clock. This is when the murder's going to happen, right? Gilda Jeffries whitened under her heavy makeup. It's it's the hour, she whispered uh, ominously. Wade loosened his service thirty two in its shoulder holster. Nothing happened. Five minutes passed. Ten, twenty. The tension had noticeably relaxed. Relaxed. So, okay, so there's not going to be a murder after all, I guess. Judge Jeffries yawned ostentatiously. District Attorney... Uh, Halloran rose. He was smiling a bit shamefacedly. Looks as though this Durkin's threat was a false alarm, he admitted. I think I'll move along, he said to Ben Wayne. You better stay here the rest of the night, Sergeant. Keep your eyes open. Okay. Gilded Jeffries went with Halloran to the front door. After a moment, Wade heard the door open and close again. Gilded Jeffries returned to the study. And then the telephone rang. Okay, so the story's called Murder by Telephone, so we know something's going to probably happen here. In the stillness of the little room, its harsh jangle sounded like a warning toskin. toxin. Don't know what that word is. It doesn't matter. Judge Jeffrey's yellow-haired wife. It's almost like he's describing two different women here because, you know, in one paragraph it's Gilda Jeffries did this, then, then Gilda Jeffries went and did this, then Judge Jeffrey's yellow-haired wife did this, picked up... Judge Jeffrey's yellow-haired wife picked up the instrument. You know, we cannot be trusted on our own for even a minute to remember what color Gilda Jeffries' hair is. It's definitely yellow or gold or dull gold. 
You know, we got to be constantly reminded of that for some reason. And then her face turned a sickly gray. She looked fearful at her husband. It's, it's for you. It sounds like the voice that, that, that called you earlier tonight. Judge Jeffries got up and took the telephone from his wife's trembling hands. Hello, he spoke sharply into the transmitter. He seemed to listen for a brief mo instant. Then abruptly his whole body contorted in a spasm of agon agony. His face became a grimaced mask of horror. The knuckles of the hand that gripped the telephone suddenly whitened. A thin wisp of steam-like smoke issued from his ear where the receiver was pressed. There's so smoke coming out of the phone, the earpiece of the phone. Ben Wade, as the cop leaped to his feet, the, older, the odor of burning flesh reached his widened nostrils, nauseating, acrid. Abruptly, the telephone clattered from Judge Henry's ner nerveless, relaxed fingers. Fingers relaxed because he's electrocuted, I guess. The jurist... The jurist toppled forward to the floor and lay very still. God Almighty, Wade cried. He knelt over the prone form of the white-haired judge. <laughs> the white-haired judge? The gray-templed white-haired judge. <laughs> he fumbled for the fallen man's pulse. Then he looked up. He's, he's dead, killed before our very eyes, which is helpful for these two people in a room with a man who they just watched killed with their very eyes for him to comment to... Uh, Make it clear that he was killed before the very eyes. Gilda Jeffries, that's the wife, remember. Hope you didn't forget. It's been almost two sentences since she was named, uh, given her full name. Gilda Jeffries screamed once. Good. Uh, the number of screams is important there. She screamed once. Then she swayed forward. Wade caught her in his arms. He slapped her across the face. His fingers left a stinging print on her cheek. Snap out of it, he snarled. Quick, go to the front door and yell like hell. This house is surrounded by detectives. Get them in here. So she faints. He catches her. And then, and in the same action, I guess he holds her with one hand while he slaps her with the other. And uh, <laughs> then he tells her to go outside and yell. She doesn't do anything as far as... The description here, she, she just fainted and he hit her, but he's apparently she recovers from the slap and goes out to yell for the, uh, f for the other detectives who haven't noticed all this screaming and yelling and commotion in the house, I guess. Police surgeon shows up, chapter two. Uh, the, the surgeon, the coroner, I guess, shows up and says, a death by electrocution, the medical man said succinctly. He got a shot of juice as strong as if he'd been sitting in the electric chair. So somebody wired the phone to electrocute him when he got a call. Uh, quite a mystery. Uh, the, the, the district attorney comes back. There's some deal about a new phone cord heavy enough to carry a high voltage for was put in. And... And then the, the, the smoking gun, Halloran looks significantly at Detective Sergeant, Detective Sergeant Ben Wade. Joe Duncan, that's the guy who swore revenge on the judge, was a telephone repairman before he was convicted of murder. Obviously, he's the person who wired the phone to kill the judge. Brilliant plan. Gilda Jeffries drew a sharp, agonized breath. Her dress drew tight with the sudden stiffening of her breasts. Okay. God in heaven, she moaned. Suddenly, there was a telephone repairman here in the house this afternoon. All right, so they've cracked the case uh, right now. At this point, we know one thing for sure. Uh, it's so obvious that Durkin wired, who swore revenge on the cop, who swore revenge on the judge is definitely the murderer and since the story is only in the beginning of chapter 2 and it's you know it's another 10 12 pages ago we definitely know that he's being set up right okay all right so they go out they they take out the judge the cop goes out he he, the, job, the cop goes out to look for clues. Wade leaned forward and delved into the shrubbery. Shrubbery is looking around. He sees something ghostly white in the shrubbery. His fingers counted the small white object. 
It was cold and clammy to the touch. He pulled it out. Good God, he said in a strangled voice. The object was a hand, a, a man's severed hand, a hand bloodless and pallid and gruesome, hacked off at the joint of the wrist. Oh, so, so Wade uh, turns around, he's got this hand, and he's, you know, he's got to report this clue to the district attorney. He gets knocked on the back of the head, blackness descends, he wakes up in a hospital. There's a nurse, helpfully there, who explains everything that happened to him. In the meantime, um, Wade asks the nurse, uh, what about the hand I found? And she's like, what hand? So he knows the evidence has been stolen. He jumps out of the hospital. He goes back to the mansion, the scene of the crime. Now, at this point... Uh, I read like half the story to you. I guess I could just keep reading it. It's fair use because I'm commenting. Okay, he's, he goes around, he looks around, he's looking for more evidence, blah, blah, blah. So at this point, uh, okay, then he discovers that Joe Durkin, the condemned murderer, the suspect, was actually, has actually died uh, and his body has been found without a hand so he knows the 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 hand belongs to Joe Durkin even though the hand was found on the property and Joe Durkin's body was found at a train tracks far away uh, a light switch clicked the hall's blackness was changed to soft illumination from a wall fixture Ben Wade stared into the unwavering black muzzle of a tiny automatic in the hand of Gilda Jeffries because as soon as Wade realizes that that Joe Durkin died mysteriously uh, someplace far from the the scene of the crime, but he remembers finding his hand at the scene of the crime. He knows that his body was moved or there's some kind of nefarious thing and something's not up. And we know, since there's only four characters in the story, there's the detective, there's the victim, there's the wife, there's the district attorney, and there's the dead uh, Patsy, uh, we know who the real murderer must be, right? The yellow-haired woman was clad in a sheer nightgown of peach-colored silk and lace. Her golden hair, her yellow golden hair, fell in waves over her soft white shoulders. Wade could see the intimate curves of her voluptuous body, body through the clinging silk of her gossamer gown. Her bare feet were thrust into high-heeled feathered mules. So... If she's wearing, she's wearing shoes or she's not barefoot. Anyway, he could discern this, the curving sweep of flesh where rounded legs melted into firm, milky thighs. Where rounded legs melted into firm, milky thighs and feminine, almost oriental hips. I do not understand that sentence at all. He could discern the curving sweeps of flesh where rounded legs melted into firm, milky thighs. I don't think legs and are separate from thighs, you know, th thighs are part of the leg. And her her hips are feminine, almost orientally so. Don't know. Maybe that was just a, you know, a convention of the time. Uh, you know, I don't, I've never thought of Occidental versus Asian hips being that different. Her breasts were high and full and prominent. Their every detail plainly apparent through the gauzy lace of the night gown. Her eyes widened when she recognized Detective Sergeant Ben Wade. She lowered the automatic. Oh, Sergeant Wade, she she breathed unevenly. You, you frightened me. I thought Joe Durkin had come back. Then he explains, yeah, I know Joe Durkin's dead. Uh, you know, I've, I'm on to you now. I, I know that uh, you hit me over the head or you've got an accomplice that did or something and, you know, now you are here with a gun and uh, he looked at her. A heavy perfume seemed to emanate from her scantily clad body. Her lovely breasts rose and fell seductively. Her eyes were dark and languorous and pleading. He grinned, all right, I'll stay with you. So it seemed, I wonder if there's like an editorial demand, like every three paragraphs at a minimum, there must be a description of breasts. Uh, and there's only one character, or there's only one female character in the story, so it's, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on boobs. 
you know, because they had limited things that they could say censorship-wise, I suppose. Uh, automatically, his home went around her softly pliant wrist, so apparently her feminine wiles were working on him now. Just the creaking board, he assured her. She sank weakly to a studio couch, her senseless body trembling as she caught on her arm and drew him alongside her. One shoulder strap of her thin silken nightgown had fallen over her arm. He caught a generous glimpse of her full, sweetly rounded breast. Infinitely alluring now without its gossamer covering. Okay, so I guess her, her strap fell off and exposed her breast, I guess is I guess that's a way to say it. <clears throat> She saw his eyes resting in her exposed charms, yet made no move to shield her body from his appreciative gaze. Instead, she favored him with a sidelong, provocative glance and edged closer closer to the couch. Hold me, hold me tight, she whispered. I'm afraid, I'm not afraid when you're close to me. So, her husband having died a few hours ago, she wants to have sex with the policeman. He kissed her. Somehow her negligee had slipped down over her swelling bosoms. Somehow her negligee had slipped down over her swelling bosoms, like I would think it would be off her swelling bosoms, bearing them to his caress. This is really a boob story. This is very, very much a boob story. Gently he pressed his hot hand over one warm, creamy hemisphere of flesh and felt its firm, jutting mound growing hard against his palm. Creamy hemisphere of flesh and felt its firm jutting mound. So is the breast the firm jutting mound? Or is he, was the writer trying to say nipple and maybe like nipple's a band word or something. Uh, and so he's calling uh, the nipple a jutting mound on her creamy hemisphere of flesh. Uh, she stretched out sideways on the studio couch, arms upflung over her head to reveal the satiny smooth white curves of her delicious armpits. Oh yeah, okay, now we're getting a little fetish action going on, it seems to me. The lower hem of the peach-colored silk nightgown. Got to remember to put in the color of the nightgown every single time, just like the color of her hair. Peach-colored silk nightgown was drawn up above her knees. Wade could see the honey-smooth whiteness of her thighs. Okay, now it's getting pretty juicy probably have to stop reading now. She underlaid a passion desire. Wade rolled the top of her, pinning her down and grab her wrist, blah, blah, blah. You, you, uh, her eyes were dying out wild with rage. Okay, okay. Then he grinned into her face, reached into his pocket, extracted clinking handcuffs and snapped them on her struggling arms. He got up. Her eyes were dilated and wild with rage. You, you, she screamed, Wade. Wade said, where's your lover, the man who killed your husband? <laughs> he cracked the case. He cracked the case. He figured out it was the wife and an accomplice, a male accomplice. Who could it be? There's four people in the story. See, this is why you don't think of it so much, but like someone like someone like a, a good mystery writer like Agatha Christie or someone who's really a genius, just by the simple fact that they are able to put in more characters to make to make a, a bit of a mystery. I mean, there's Wade. It's not him because he's arresting her. There's her. She has an accomplice. There's the judge. He's dead. There's the Patsy. He's dead. There's only one other character in the story, the district attorney, who set this whole thing up. So guess what? Where is your loving the man who killed your husband? She paled with sickly gray white. You get me, Wade Snarled. You know damn well what I'm talking about. You were in love with another man. You wanted to be rid of your husband, Judge Jeffries. In case we've forgotten in the last 2,000 words who her husband was and who the victim of the crime was, it was Judge Jeffries. So you plotted to kill him. Somebody bribed the guard who was taking Joe Durkin, a convicted murderer. <laughs> you really don't have to pay attention to the story at all because in every single sentence the the writer is going to recap every single character's position in the story you bribed the guard who was taking Joe Durkin a convicted murderer to the penitentiary and the guard allowed Durkin to escape then your lover who was waiting in that, the pre-arranged spot captured Durkin and killed him in cold blood blah 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 plan of the body before Durkin was buried in the cellar, your sweetheart, sweetheart cut off the dead man's hand. And, oh, I guess they cut off the dead man's hand uh, so they could use the fingerprints to frame him for uh, rigging the telephone. Uh, 
you know, it was explained early on that Durkin was a telephone repair man before he, which is why, which is what makes him the perfect patsy for this crime. Never explained how the the actual perpetrator of this kind crime knew how to uh, booby trap telephones because he's not a former telephone repairman. He's the district attorney. Ha! <gasps> You put, you planted the fingerprints. Uh, well, that's this is pretty lurid. I think I'll skip that part. Um, very sadistic. Okay, he's threatening to burn her skin with a cigarette to get the confession out of her. Charming. Uh, she opened her mouth to scream. Her eyes sought a point beyond Ben Way. The detective saw that glance. He whirled just time to duck uh, to duck a murderous blow from an upraised chair in the hands of a man whose face was contorted in maniacal fury. This is the boyfriend. Wade's hand whipped to his shoulder holster. His service 32 leaped out. It spat fire. The chair dropped to the floor. The man who had wielded it looked stupidly at Ben Wade. He swayed, caught at his chest with clawing fingers and slumped awkwardly downward. Wade said, so he, sh he so he shoots, so Wade, the cop, shoots the, the accomplice, the boyfriend, the lover of Gilda Jeffries, Mrs. Judge Jeffries, Gilda, blonde-haired, uh, peach uh, silk uh, negligee-wearing, blonde-haired, platinum-haired, uh, dull gold-haired Gilda Jeffries, and her lover is shot by Ben Wade. He sways, caught at his chest with clawing fingers and slumped awkwardly downward. Wade said, Well, Mr. District Attorney Halloran, I guess that settles your hash for a while. So it was the District Attorney who set the whole thing up. Uh, being the only, being the last character in the story who's, who, uh, it could, the only character in the story it could have been, there's no red herrings or anything like that. Halloran groaned and doubled up on the floor. You, you, how did you guess? Says the district attorney. Ben Wade shrugged. Whoever murdered Judge Jeffries had a heavy transformer to set up the current. The transformer was nowhere in evidence after the murder. Yet there was no trace of any vehicle that might have brought such equipment. Blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Figured out something about the car. Who cares? Uh, oh, and the car, the heavy transformer. They needed a heavy transformer to carry the current. And it was in the back seat of the of the car that was speeding forward to the estate in the first scene. Clever. District Attorney Halloran's face took on a greenish hue. He's dying. The man was suddenly very sick. I mean, he he retched, spilling blood on the carpet. I mean, he has been shot in the chest. Wade went on relation relentlessly. You left this house telling me to stay here and keep my eyes open. You went back to your coupe, but before you drove away, you connected the transformer in the back end of your car to the switch on the other side of the garage, and then you used the dead man's hand, Joe Durkin's hand, in case we're not clear who the dead man with the severed hand was anymore, to throw that switch and electrocute Judge Jeffries. Then in your haste to get away, you dropped that hand. You didn't discover it's lost until some time later. You know, see, they always slip, slip up. These murderous uh, district attorney lovers of... The young wives, the young second wives of of powerful judges, always sw slip up and leave a clue at the crime, like the severed hand that they use to plant fingerprints. Anyway, you knew that Joe Durkin would have been accused of murder, and Joe Durkin would never be found by the police because he was dead and buried in this very cellar. Oh, I thought he was dead on a train track. A anyway. It's all true, isn't it, Halloran? Wade repeated savagely. So this is convention is going on quite a while while uh, while District Attorney Halloran is bleeding to death. But you know, all things must end. So it's true, isn't it, Halloran? Wade repeated savagely. Halloran didn't answer. Halloran would never answer anything thing again. The district attorney was dead, so he finally succumbs to his wounds. Wade turned to the manacle, manacled, half-nude figure of Gilda Jeffries. He pulled up the shoulder straps of her peach-colored silk nightgown and covered her creamy best breasts disinterestedly. You know, but at least we know what she was wearing at this point in the story. 
in case we forgot from the previous page. <clears throat> okay, so he redresses Gilda Jeffries. He's not, he's not interested in her creamy breasts anymore because she's a murderer. Um, if we really don't know how you deal with all this dress and everything when she's got uh, handcuffs on, whatever. Anyway, Wade says, I'd advise you to confess the whole thing and plead guilty, he said grimly. Then you'll get off with a life sentence. That's better than hanging. Well, this is solid, this is solid uh, uh, legal advice. You know, if you confess, you'll, you, you will live in, out your natural life in jail instead of hanging. She looked at him with her weary, defeated harlot's eyes. Oh, echoes of, um, of Cormac McCarthy here, right at the end. She looked at him with her weary, defeated harlot's eyes. I'll plead guilty, she answered dully. The end. <laughs> so, f fun story, you know, just completely silly, completely of its, of its time. You know, probably more representative of... You know, think of how many massive uh, mountains and mountains of pulp magazines there were at the time. You know, and it's just, I don't know, it fascinates me. Maybe it's kind of obvious. It fascinates me how much the sheer volume of, and you know, the, the sheer volume of fiction and stories that are produced and like what small percentage of it you know comes down to us through the ages so i enjoyed it it's absurd and silly i don't know why i read it to you but anyway if you stuck through this and i don't know why you would have thanks very much and that is the first story in the the mega pack spicy mystery mega pack and I don't think I'll, I'll subject you to this again, but if, if you watch the whole thing, let me know in the comments. I'd be curious. I've never actually, I don't know why I ended up doing that, reading that story to you, most of it. But anyway, it's all content. <laughs>